William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. A lady killer is sometimes the worst dressed guy around. How much of a figure can he cut in prison dress? National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Craig speaking. You meet out exhibits in the human jungle. Walk down any street, especially when the hour is late. The species that creep by night. Call them neurotic. Call them throwbacks to the time when man stalked his prey with a club. You meet them and the chill on your spine spells out the word danger. Got a match, Cap? Got a match. Only a device to stop you. The next demand is your wallet or your life. You reach into your pocket for a match and what you come up with, you ram into her stomach. Uh, uh, what's this? A loaded gun. Hands touching the stars. <laughs> Frisk me. All you'll get is exercise, Cap. I got empty pockets. No switchblade knife? Yeah, you do have one. A lousy dollar knife. I still don't want it in me, butcher boy. And you? Hey, are you a stick-up or not? You're the stick-up. I mean, would be. I'm a detective. A dick? You picked the wrong victim. Walk ahead of me. Hands nice and high. You, you're taking me in? I am. Well, Cap, look, I only asked for a match. As a prelude to mugging? Concealed weapons. There's a city ban against switchblade knives. Cap, don't run me in. I'm asking you. Have a heart. Allergic to the station house, huh? Yeah, that figures too. More in your mind than a switchblade knife. I wonder what it is. I learned more about the boy from a career cop named Kennedy, Sergeant Kennedy. Rough customer you brought in, Craig. On the surface. And on the inside. You're overrating a punk. What's his record? The usual. Petty theft, illegal entry, stolen cars, disorderly conduct, street fights. Meaning he served time? One year. In a correctional institution for juvenile delinquents. Hmm. What's his neighborhood gang called? The Tarantulas. The worst of the teenage mobs. Besides creeping by night, uh, what does uh, Spike Sanger do? He's enrolled in a vocational high school. A course in repair mechanics. Father, mother, people? Father's dead. Lived with his mother, Mrs. Stella Sanger. Mother's a factory worker. Sweat him, Kennedy. Find his breaking point. My hunch is you wrap up a lot of stuff currently indexed as unsolved crimes. Spike Sanger popped back into my life the following afternoon in the form of a visitor to my office. A girl of 17... Midi blouse, wide balloon skirt, ballet shoes of the Capizio type. She had books under her arm, a stenographer's practice pad. Are you Mr. Barry Craig? Well, you entered without knocking. I was preoccupied. I'm Bernice Cannon. Selling magazine subscriptions? I'm here about Spike Sanger. Oh. We keep company, Spike and I. I wouldn't advertise it. You're prejudiced against Spike like all the rest. The rest of society. You fine, righteous people. You all make me sick. Well, we got into this quarrel awfully fast. I didn't come here intending to quarrel. Why did you come? To beg you to help Spike, not persecute him. To ask you to think of him as a human being. You want me to withdraw my complaint? How can I accomplish anything with Spike if people like you arrest him on sight? Bernice. Yes? Are you employed? Part-time as a typist... I'm taking courses in stenography at a continuation school. I see. I'm told Spike's enrolled in a vocational high school. Whose idea was that? Mine. It was a bargain we made. If, if we were going to keep company, then he was... I'll, uh... I'll think it over. And then maybe I'll intercede for your boyfriend. I'll see if I can help him. How long have you known Spike Sanger? All my life. 
Where I was born, Spike was the baby next door. I interceded for Spike Sanger. The district attorney yawned listening to me and then brushed me out of his office. An hour later, Sergeant Kennedy explained my failure to me. There's something the D.A. couldn't tell you. What? What's officially developed with Spike Sanger. We sweated the boy like you advised. We found his breaking point. What did he confess to? Armed robbery and murder. You're shocked, huh, Craig? Yes, I am. Give me the details, Kennedy. Well, one month ago in the lower Bronx, a masked gunman stuck up the cashier of a loan association. The cashier was partly deaf, wore a hearing aid normally. But at the moment, it was turned off. He was eating his lunch. So he was slow to comply, slow getting over to the cash drawer. The gunman interpreted this as defiance. Bang! Shot the cashier dead. Hall amounted to over $8,000, currency and coin. Would Spike Sanger confess to this crime? Spelled out every detail for us. Practically reenacted it for us. Well, the story's been in the newspapers. Uh, every detail of the crime is common public knowledge. Spike Sanger knew stuff that never appeared in the press, Craig. Like? Like the exact amount of money in the cash drawer. The press mistakenly estimated it around $6,000. We never corrected them. How much did Spike Sanger say? A few bucks shy of $8,500. That figure was only known to the loan association management, to the insurance company involved, and to the DA's office. I want to see Spike Sanger, Kennedy. They had Spike Sanger in the tombs. They were still sweating him, trying to get answers to other crimes listed on the books as unsolved. He was on the edge of his cot, head down between his knees. In the dumps with that look in his face a guy gets when he's turning suicide over in his mind. They'd confiscated his necktie, his belt, and shoelaces. You get out of here, Cap. You branded yourself a killer, I'm told. Yeah. And I'm your arrest. Pick up your medal at the front desk, hero. Not a shred of evidence pointing at you. A crime that's a month old and cold. You'd never have been tagged for it. <laughs> you sound like you're mad, I confessed. Self-protection is human nature, even among punks. It's unnatural to beg for electrocution. So I'm a freak. Cap, get out of here. Soon. I frisked you the other night. You were flat broke, not a red cent. Not even a whole cigarette on you. You were snitching butts from the gutter. Oh, now you're going to make poverty a crime, huh? What happened to the $8,500 you grabbed from the Loan Association till? What happened? I blew it in. Where? Uh, here and there. Broads, gin mills. I played some pool. I bet on the fights. Went down to the racetrack. A pigeon has wings, so has money. You claim to have spent $8,500 in one short month? Listen, I've been 17 years dreaming of one big binge, so I had it. Now, Cap, will you get out of here? How's your confession going to sit with Bernice Cannon? Bernice? She loves you. Love? How's that? How's your confession going to sit with your mother? My mom. <laughs> ah, she's ahead. My confession puts her ahead. I've been bumming eight bucks a week from her, money for smokes and the movies. Get out of here, will you? I want you to get out of here. But Mama Sanya wasn't rejoicing over her eight-buck raise and pay. I can't make you welcome in my house, Mr. Craig. I'm not really the cause of your son's troubles, Mrs. Sanger. You arrested Spike. His trouble started with you. If not for you... His trouble started a long time before me, Mrs. Sanger. Post-infancy, boyhood, adolescence. Kids are okay, and then they're not okay. When did he begin to get wild? Boy in the slums with an invalid father and a tired factory worker for a mother. A boy who was still hungry getting up from the supper table... Never had a suit or shoes that somebody hadn't worn before him. Yet he had enough faith in, in his heart to go to church every Sunday with his father. When did the father die? When Spike was 13 years old. Was it after the death of his father that Spike began to, well, 
get difficult, get into scrapes. Oh, I, I don't know when or, or what. Live in a neighborhood like this. Drunks sleeping on the stoops and in the halls, a, a saloon on every corner, filth, broken plumbing, vermin. Do you expect boys to grow up into angels? No, you can't expect... Well, do you think Spike is guilty of the crime of murder? My son is wild, but he's not vicious. He could never kill another human being. He's confessed that he has. Oh, a boy tells stories. A boy tells stories to make himself great. Murders are great people. The newspapers make them famous. In the Sanger living room, Spike's girl, Bernice, had her own brand of scorn. The miracle to me is that Spike didn't confess to assassinating McKinley or sinking the Titanic. You think he lied in his confession? I know. Elaborate on that. The day of the holdup in that loan association. The day and the time. Could Spike be there and be with me, too? You're saying he was with you? And 20 miles away from New York. We were hiking in Palisades Park. We had a cookout, frankfurters and toasted English muffins. We picnicked all day. That's your alibi for Spike? Go ahead. Be cynical. Mistrust everybody. You love him. You'd naturally try to save him. No, Mr. Craig. No? If Spike was a murderer, I couldn't love him. Why would Spike confess to a crime he's innocent of? He's bitter. He's disturbed. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Where could Spike have picked up certain hidden details of the Loan Association stick-up? Facts about it that never were accurately reported in the newspapers. How? Gossip, talk on the streets, somebody boasting in a beer saloon where Spike was with his friends, something somebody else told him. Uh, tell me this, is there some man somewhere that Spike likes or admires, an older man? Yeah, there is. Who? Mr. Milton. He's the school psychologist in Spike's vocational high school. Mr. Milton, Spike respects him. But why? Just feeling my way. What if it turns out that Spike is guilty as per his confession? I'll cry for a long time, Mr. Craig. And then I'll never in my life cry again. Is there something I can do to help Spike? Mm, yes, there is. First, go down to the Legal Aid Society. Take Mrs. Sanger along. Tell them about Spike and solicit their legal help. Then give them an affidavit of that time alibi you claim for your boyfriend. I'll do that. And do this. That uh, street gang Spike hangs uh, out with. The tarantulas. Uh, drop a hint here and there. Let the word circulate on the grapevine that Spike deliberately confessed falsely. That Spike deliberately... For the headlines, the notoriety. That he has a way out and isn't really worried. He's got a time alibi covering the murder day. And uh, get this rumor going. That Spike knows everything there is to know about the murder of that cashier. Everything there is to know, meaning... He knows who the real murderer is. That's the inference I want somebody to draw. Draw the inference and get a little panicky, panicky enough to make some open move. At the vocational high school, the psychologist, Mr. Milton, showed genuine distress for Spike Sanger. The news came as a terrible shock. Uh, you were professionally interested in Spike. Even personally, Spike has charm and likability and cooperative qualities. Last term, he earned 14 service credits. Well, uh, what has been your gauge of Spike Sanger? A certain emotional instability, normally optimistic, but then fits of depression. What causes them? Certain emotional maladjustment, uh, deep feelings of inferiority, guilts. Guilts about what? Well, I, I can't say. If we knew that, we could get to the root cause of his behavior. Well, what generally did Spike confide in you? Spike once blurted that he'd not attended his father's funeral, that he'd purposely hidden himself away all that day in a neighborhood movie. I see. Love for the mother, not so much love for the father. Now, tell me this. Could a boy confess to a crime he didn't commit? Yes, a boy could. Why? 
Mm, perhaps to punish himself for some other guilt, some secret feeling of guilt. Could an innocent boy insist on his guilt in a situation where punishment might mean the electric chair? Even so, yes. A boy bent on self-destruction could conceivably make such a confession. If Spike is asking for execution because of some secret guilt feelings, those secret guilts uh, can't be the common, ordinary variety. Specify your thought, Mr. Craig. Okay, I'll specify. Say the boy wants to pay the capital penalty. Electrocution for a crime he didn't do. That suggests that the crime he did do is right up to size. His secret guilt feelings are over murder. Some undisclosed murder. Well? Hmm, it's never as simple as that, Mr. Craig. Why not? Spike Sanger may feel secret guilt about some undisclosed murder. But that murder need not be actual. It can be imagined. It can be hallucinatory. He thinks he's guilty of it, but he's not. Yes. What we call the crime may be wholly fancied. Or, even if real, Spike can have magnified his own role in it, his uh, responsibility for it. I see. Oh, do I? Well, thanks, Mr. Milton. Bernice Cannon reported her success with the Tarantula Gang grapevine to me. We met in a remote place. A wharf that uh, looked over the uh, Hudson River. It feels kind of funny being so clandestine, so furtive. Try to flush out a killer, you take risks. I don't want you spotted working with me. I don't want you hurt. Now, what's the story? I have definite progress to report. Well, tell me. I dropped hints, as you told me to, about Spike's confession being false and how Spike knew every detail there was to that, that, that happening. The robbery and murder. Well, I spent one evening in a social club the tarantulas keep up. A horrid, dingy cellar. I didn't even have to broach the subject or be clever. The boys were buzzing with it, huh? Yeah. Well, go on. Well, last night, I was approached on my street by a fellow known as Lou Lennox. Lennox is older. He's at least 24. But he's around teenagers. A smooth person with slits for eyes. A nervous twitch here in his cheeks. Constant twitch. Once a minute. Hold your eyes. You're fascinated. Symptoms of a drug eater, I'd say. That figures, too. Armed robbery, wanton murder, and narcotics. They'll go on. Lennox played up to me. Every male trick of charm and insinuation. How pretty I was and my figure. Why wasn't I in show business? Then he began talking about Spike. As artfully as he could, but so obviously. He pumped me for details and all that time, that awful twitch... Lennox showed anxiety? Yes. If ever I've seen a man deep down afraid, he asked me for a date. Pretended he was falling for me. He wants from you all that Spike knows about the loan association murder. Lennox figures a date and a few drinks will loosen you up. It's to be tonight. Lennox has a car. He'll be outside my house. Mm-hmm. I'll keep the date. <laughs> Later that evening, I parked myself outside Bernice's house. Soon enough, Bernice's date rolled up. A souped-up convertible built of special parts taken from a half dozen other cars. It had pink fenders. Lennox had his horn going, signaling for Bernice to come down. I went to join him. Move over, Lennox. I'll take the wheel. Who, who are you? What does my gun suggest? Uh, hood or a cop? The cop. Bernice isn't disposed for fun tonight, but I am. Fun? I, I... Fun with you. We're going to hold up somewhere and play charades. Play charades? Look, what... I'm going to tell you about a loan association office in the lower Bronx and a oh. deaf cashier who wore a hearing aid. And then, from the material I supply, you're going to tell me who done it. <laughs> amazed even himself. He lasted all night. With the break of dawn, he reached his breaking point. At headquarters, I waited until the police stenographer completed typing up the Lennox confession. Kennedy stood around looking just a little perplexed. Two confessions to the same murder. Which do you believe, Kennedy? Lennox's. He's been up for murder before, and not only that... All cut. 
I want a carbon of Lennox's confession. Sure. Typist is finished here. And now I want it signed. Then I want to pass to the tombs. Sure. Sure thing. I watched Spike Sanger read the confession to murder, signed by Lennox. Lou Lennox. He moved into the neighborhood when I was only a kid. Seven. He's moving out of the neighborhood and into the hot seat. And you're going home, Spike. Home. <laughs> yeah, they'll hang out the flags and throw me a block party. Bernice stuck with you all the way. She found Lennox for me. When a girl like Bernice is loyal to a guy, there must be something to the guy. Yeah, a whams in the girl's head. Oh, she's crazy enough to couple off with Sam Kuzak. Sam's big for music. He's out there in the Lewiston Stadium summer nights. And that lounge Rather's old man owns. Oh, how the coin rolls in. Bernice is for you, Spike. Only you, all the way. Mm. Whams in her head. Whams. They buried your father when you were 13, Spike. While the funeral was on, you were hard to find. You hid in the movies. Why do you bring that up? An idea I picked up. You got along fine with your mother, but not with your father. There you were uh, antagonistic. He sat in that chair with his bum heart. Always in that chair, waiting for me to come home from school. Waiting to get busy with something. Get busy with you. Always lacing it into me. For nothing. The worst words he knew. And throwing things at me. Oh, he was a nervous man. In his prime years, but a useless invalid. Oh, sure. He had that excuse. That I was the butt. I was the goat. Do you feel guilty about your father's death? Feel guilty? Me? Do you have some idea that you murdered him, Spike? That... That day Pop keeled over. And then the ambulance doctor pronounced him. Pronounced. Huh? You'd come home from school, and there'd been a quarrel, the usual quarrel. Then your father suffered a heart attack. I killed him. I got him so excited, he fell down on the floor. So that's it, huh? You blame yourself for a death that had to happen sooner or later, that day or the next day or the next week. If I'd have shut up, if I'd kept my trap shut. You see yourself as your father's murderer. In your secret guilt. So you tried to die for a crime you had nothing to do with. It, it's crazy, huh? You're mixed up, Spike. But you're a decent kid. In your own odd way, a very decent kid. And now that that's what's had you so confused is out in the open, I think you'll be okay. With just a little clinical help, I know you'll be very okay. You sound like we're coming out of this friends. We're friends. Sure, Spike. We're friends, all right. You've been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Confession of Murder was written by John Robert. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production with William Gargan starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator, directed by Andrew C. Love. Our cast included Jack Edwards, Barney Phillips, Jane Webb, Noreen Gamill, Stanley Farrar, and Paul Richards. Convicts tell their true life stories on The Loser tonight over most NBC radio stations. 